Thank you, Emma, and thank you all very much for coming. It's a pleasure and a privilege to address uh, you uh, this afternoon as one of the first of two lectures I'm giving at the occasion of the opening of the Earth Institute. Uh, Earth Institute is almost as audacious an idea as some of mine uh, to try to understand the interactions and the cacophony and the balancing uh, ecology and environmental things that are going on. My own background is uh, largely in studying genetics and I was told early on at NIH that the proper way to do science was to focus, to pick something uh, that you thought was interesting that nobody else cared about and work on it until you died. I ignored that advice and I have never focused on anything but rather I have always looked broadly into the diversity of science and the diversity of nature to try to really understand and contribute to some of the many mysteries that I began to discover when I was very young and continue to discover as I grow older, mostly from my talented students like Emma. So what I'd like to talk about today is about how a field uh, which didn't exist uh, 30 years ago, comparative genomics, can inform us about not only the process of creating genomes such as the ones we study, but also in interpreting how they function. Um, I will start by mentioning something you all know, which is that we, 11 years ago, celebrated the accomplishment of sequencing the human genome, about three billion base letters that uh, encode the gene script for making a human being. It was uh, celebrated by uh, uh, simultaneous issues in Nature and Science magazine and the pages were full of very interesting things and a lot of really boring things. But what was really interesting about it was that uh, there was so much that we didn't understand after looking at that script. Uh, they did another draft genome in 2003 and they discovered some more things and we've seen many translation into human medicine and to human understanding, but we still have many kinds of questions that are occurring. Uh, we don't really know what all the genes that we have do. We don't know uh, which of the single nucleotide polymorphisms regulate which characters so well. We don't know where and why genes function as well as we should. We know, won't really understand how genes came to be and why they are arranged as such. And we don't know which genes make us human as opposed to a bat or a rat or a dog or a manatee. We don't know which of the genes are critical and which are dispensable if we knock them out with a mutation. We are beginning to understand the regulatory elements. There was a major uh, data dump about last year from the ENCODE project, which identified that the 90% of so-called nonsense or useless or junk DNA really wasn't nonsense, useless or junk, but contained regulatory sequences and sequences that were transcribed. We don't know, understand very well the expansion and contraction of gene families in uh, certain lineages, and I could go on and on, but I don't, really want to, but rather uh, what I'd really like to do instead is to mention that comparative genomics is really taking into account a uh, dictum that Dobzhansky himself, the namesake of the institute that I'm now fortunate enough to belong to, what he said a few years ago when I was a young postdoc, he said nothing in biology really makes any sense except in light of evolution. And this is really what the whole idea of comparative genomics is. It was started out as trying to understand a little bit more about human gene organization. And I would mention that it's, comparative biology is not new. Uh, it's been around for 500 years when early anatomists and medical uh, doctors were studying rabbits and cats to understand the anatomy of humans. And they also studied organ metabolism and medicine and other kinds of physiology. It's just that only recently have we have the gene maps and now the full genome sequences that can allow us to understand the evolutionary patterns that have led to the genome organization and functioning that we all strive to understand in what we call the genomics era. Now in order to understand that a little bit better, we also should understand that we are mammals, which means that we are connected in a vast genealogical network to about 
5,000 mammalian species, all of which descend from a small insectivore-like creature that ran around under the feet of the dinosaurs between 100 and 200 million years ago. And that creature uh, would evolve once the dinosaurs went extinct 63 million years ago into the major orders of mammals that are recognizable today, the horses, the artiodactyls, the cetaceans, the primates and the apes, the carnivores, the dogs and cats and skunks, and the insectivores and the other recognizable species of mammals. It all happened when the dinosaurs went extinct because the Earth had a bunch of ecological niches which were vacated when the meteorite hit 63 million years ago into the Gulf of Mexico and knocked off most of the dinosaurs except for one group, the birds, which are still among us, as you know. Now, that a picture of one of those creatures is shown right here, our ancestors right here. It doesn't look like you or me much, but it actually does have DNA genome organization, which is quite recognizable. So because of the importance of understanding our roots and our comparative biology, the National Institutes of Health decided that they should go ahead and sequence a few species of mammals outside of mouse and rats. So they set up a committee of, of heads of sequencing centers and myself and a few others to select 25 or so species to, uh, to do the uh, whole genome sequence so we could align them and compare them to other species. So rapidly, within a few years, a series of whole genome sequences appeared. The human genome had a cost of something on the order of two billion U.S. dollars to achieve between the years of 1990 and 2001. These species cost less than three million dollars apiece with the so-called old-fashioned Sanger sequencing technology. And they led to a number of exciting papers on comparative genomics, which have also come out in the same journals that we see, and they feature it. This is a evolutionary tree, or a phylogenetic tree, which lists the mammalian radiations, but it only includes the species which the committee that NIH Genome Institute selected for whole genome sequences. It has members of the four major groups, the elephant relatives in Afrotheria over here, the uh, uh, <coughs> relatives of the South American species, the sloth anime, uh, armadillos and uh, anteaters, this is Xenarthra, and then this is a, a group which is, uh, has, a, has an unpronounceable name of, uh, of uh, Laurasia theria, and this is Eurocontagliris. Now in this group is the dogs and the cats, and the cat's actually in there because I was on the committee. Now the other group contains the primates, the humans, and so forth. So these sequences were all completed, about, all about the same size as humans, had many of the same genes and many of the same features, a few uh, uh, years ago, back in about 2005 to 2008. That's when it all occurred. Now at this stage, the introduction I'd given you could have been given by any of a uh, few dozen of my friends and colleagues who have led genome sequencing projects. However, the direction I'm going in now is a personal one. It is one that I selected because I selected the cat family as an interesting group to study. If, if uh, somebody else was here, they might be talking about primates, they might be talking about rats. If Emma was up, she'd be talking about the bats. If uh, Harris Loon was here, he'd be talking about the cattle. And there's different kinds of experts. And they're all just as articulate and much brighter than I am. But this is going to be my explanation to you about where we're going and how we did it by illustrating it through the genome project, which I call the Cat Genome Project. But to understand that, we have to look back a little bit, too, by asking the same question T.S. Eliot asked, which is, what is a cat? And basically, it's a domesticated version of a small wild cat, which is one of 37 species of what we call the family Felidae. They are the most successful of predators, with one exception, and the exception is sitting in this room, humankind. Uh, but other than that, they're pretty good. They live and cross the globe in tropical Asia, in North America, in South America, in Africa, and in Europe. And people pretty much agree on most of the species identifications. But what was uncertain is because of the fact that the fossils of these species 
all descended from a very recent cat that lived somewhere in Asia about 10 million years ago, it was difficult to understand what the relationship between these cats were using traditional morphological descriptions, which had, of course, been going on for 100 years because these species were very charismatic and interesting to people. So when PCR and sequencing came along, our group applied the tools of molecular evolution to, se to sequence genes selected across the cat family that we could amplify with the same PCR primers and allow us to have a robust data set of over 20,000 base pairs that we could then interrogate and put into a phylogenetic framework so that we could basically resolve, if you will, a radiation where there was a different divergence node every 500,000 years. That's pretty close in time and it's difficult sometimes to resolve. Uh, we published this in uh, Science Magazine a few years ago and a popular version of it came out in uh, Scientific American and is illustrated right here. For those of you who don't know about cats, this is pretty boring. For those of you who do know about cats, you'll find it fascinating. There's about eight different uh, groups that are monophyletic lineages which were resolved with very high high, high uh, statistical rev resolution over the 10 million years of divergence. And of course this was a time when sea level was dropping up and down across the world making a difference as to whether the cats which disperse widely across continents could migrate onto the next continent or across a bridge or, or, or something like that. That's why this part's down here. And the, no, the, the years, uh, this is 6 million years, this is 6 million years, this is 1.4. The eight groups are recognizable to you. These are the great cats, the roaring cats, the lion, tiger, snow leopard, and so forth. These are the Asian golden cat. Uh, this is an Asian group consisting of the Asian golden cat and the marbled cat. This is an African group, the serval and the caracal. This is the group that migrated into South America two and a half million years ago. Uh, and radiated into what I call the ocelot lineage. Now, two and a half million years ago, before that time, uh, South America was part of a great supercontinent down south called Gondwana land floating around in the ocean, and the only species that were in there were marsupials. And they had basically migra uh, evolved into adaptations of flying ones and herbivore ones and carnivorous ones and rodent-like ones and insectivores and so forth. And they were quite successful, but they weren't as successful as the placental ones up north. So when it came together, the cats and the dogs migrated through this uh, <coughs> Panama Isthmus, and they began to look around and they saw these diminutive, puny little marsupials and they dispatched them quite quickly. They said, we don't need you. And they began occupying all the niches and that became a radiation which became the ocelot lineage and the South American dog lineage about two million years ago. I'm sorry to say that and I don't pitch it quite that way when I'm out in Australia, but nonetheless that's what happened. Uh, <clears throat> This is the uh, uh, lynxes, of which there are North American and Eurasian. This is the puma and the cheetah, which grew up in North America. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the cheetah migrated over to uh, Africa and to Asia. This is a group of Asian cats related to the Asian leopard cat. And this is a group of Mediterranean cats, which uh, 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 are related to the ancestor, the wild cat, of the domestic cat. And that's basically what we were able to see. However, by putting together this molecular phylogeny and the geological information provided to us by our colleagues in geology about the rise and fall of the, of the, uh, the sea coast and the connection, as well as the dispersion and the location of these animals in different places today. So those three things plus the fossil record, where they were in the last 10 million years. So those four pieces of information we put together to basically try to see if we could come up with an uh, estimation of where the cats actually came from. So this is one amazing journey and I, it's illustrated in an article we wrote in Scientific American a few years ago and I'd like to explain to you in summary what we think is the origin of the cats. As I mentioned, they started in Asia uh, with a middle-sized cat that weighs about 90 pounds. 
Then during the Miocene, we had to get the cats that were um, uh, the precursors of the African cat lineage caracal region into Africa. So there had to be a migration down there. Now, given this thing doesn't show the maps because they're mysterious and secret, I guess, uh, <clears throat> there was another migration across the Beringia Straits. Just I'll give you a few landmarks. This is the Vladivostok. This is uh, Alaska. This is Sarah Palin's house. This is the uh, North America. You can see that the precursors of the, of the puma, the lineage, and the ocelot migrated to North America. And then there was another migration that had to get these big cats into South America. This is the one I talked about a few minutes ago. Now, then what happened was the sea levels rose. Things kind of sat there for a while. Speciation took place. And then a few million years later, we began a migration back to get some of the, uh, the old world uh, species back. So the precursors of lynx and cheetahs came back uh, in, into Asia. The cheetah migrated down into Africa. The black-footed cat, the small Mediterranean species, and lions had to get into Africa. The lions then had to get over to North America because jaguars are still here, and lions were found in the Rancho La Brea pits up to 10,000 years ago. Then, in addition to the ocelots, we had to get the pumas and the jaguars down into South America. We did that. And then about 10,000 years ago, when there was a last ice age occurred and, the, and, the, and it extirpated a lot of the mammals in North America, including pumas and including cheetahs, then there was a migration back from the pumas. But there were no cheetahs in South America, so they basically were uh, restricted to the African thing over here. So those 12 migrations really represent, if you will, the uh, events that we think, or at least put a hypothesis out. Now, I wasn't there at the time. However, we think it's right. There might be some mistakes here, and sure, there's a lot of my friends that are kind of saying, oh, this is not right. But nonetheless, it's out there as an hypothesis put together through the inferences I've described. Now, the cheetah itself went extinct about 10,000 years ago from North America during the end of the late Pleistocene. And at that time, 40 species of large mammals went extinct abruptly. The mastodon and mammoths were walking through the American, North American continent, the giant ground sloths, several predatory birds, the saber-toothed cats. They're all gone bye-bye forever. But the cheetahs themselves are back in, only in Africa, and the rest of them you're never going to see except in the Smithsonian. Now, this is basically a National Geographic image which illustrates what I just said, sort of in, in, in terms that help us illustrate that this kind of radiation and this thing is, is something you can get with a little bit of genetics and a little bit of molecular evolutionary thought. Now, another question which came up when Emma was a postdoc back in the lab, but Emma was just a cheerleader on the side to Carlos Driscoll, was the question about where the domestic cats came from. And Carlos, who was a very talented student, who also knew how to spend money like a government employee, uh, <clears throat> was out there collecting samples from across the range of the wildcats in the world in order to see if he could work out the origins. Why was he interested in this? Well, most people thought domestication occurred in Egypt when the Egyptians venerated cats and when they uh, <clears throat> protected them, they even made them uh, queens, and there was a, a goddess called Bastet who was a cat, and that was about 3,000 years ago, so that was pretty much accepted. However, Carlos didn't buy it because he reckoned that the domestication probably took place sometime after a more, excuse me, that the Egyptian uh, fancy was, probably took place sometime afterwards. Now, most workers agreed that the domestic cat relative was this guy, the European wildcat or the African wildcat. Uh, isolated species that kind of looks like a house cat that lives in the wild in Europe, in Asia, in China, in Africa. It's all over the place. It's ubiquitous. And it's uh, related to the um, uh, uh, black-footed cat from South Africa, the jungle cat from the Middle East, the sand cat from the Middle East too. So Carlos spent about 10 years and a lot of money traveling around the world collecting samples. And these are basically a map which illustrates the color codes according to the recognized subspecies before he did any work. And the circles represent samples that he took where there are two types that were recognized by mitochondrial and STR or microsatellite divergence. There was a green type here, which was unique to the European wildcat. 
And then there was a brown type here, which was found throughout the world and in the Middle East exclusively. And that was the first hint that we had that perhaps the domestic cat lineage, which was very basically uh, extremely, um, uh, he, he had a lot of house cats in his sample, that it was indistinguishable from the cats he had collected in Israel and in Saudi Arabia and, the, and in, the, in Qatar and some of the other Middle Eastern, but distinctive at least in part. Now, I'll sh another point I'll make about this slide is when we were doing this original study, uh, Carlos was excited about the project, so was I, and we would tell people we're going to take a look at domestication and we're going to do a phylogenetic test, and my expert friends, many of them, looked at me and said, this is the stupidest idea I ever heard, and I'll tell you why. If you go out there and you have these wild cats, they're all hybridizing like crazy with the domestic cats, and you'll get no signal. So don't waste your money. Carlos didn't buy it. He says, I'm going to try. I'll figure it out. And he was very lucky because indeed there was a signal, as I say. This green part was a specific type of mitochondrial DNA haplotypes which were found only in this part of the world. And when he, when he, when he actually, now this is a simplistic version of the tree, so I'll show you the more complicated one first. This is a a uh, microsatellite tree where every line represents a single individual and it's a composite genotype of 36 uh, uh, microsatellite loci. These brown ones are all house cats. They're all showing what I call a monophyletic or a shared ancestry together. The green ones are all this green, the green cats from the wild cats in Europe. Now there's also European wild cats in here but they're the brown ones. And then there's uh, the South Africans are blue and the Central Asians are, are this, but also nested in here with these little symbols are the cats that are found way out in the field in the Middle East. And this was the beginning of his uh, view that perhaps there was a, um, there, there, there was a uh, origin uh, or at least a propinquity between domestic cats and the cats in the Middle East. This is actually a mitochondrial DNA tree which reinforced what I just showed you in the microsatellites. So you had nuclear and mitochondrial data saying pretty much the same thing. Now, when we did the coalescence dating of the um, nodes on the trees I just showed you, which is what molecular evolutionists do, we came up with numbers that um, I had a little trouble with. We found out that the coalescence state for domestic cats in the lineage and wild cats was something like, let's see, I think it was 80,000 years ago. And we didn't believe that. And the reason we didn't, because I listen to my friends in archaeology who tell me that the oldest co-occurrence of domestic cats and humans is much less than that. Most of it's 10,000 years. And I'm arrogant, but I'm not arrogant enough to say that because the molecular data show it's 10 times older that that's what it means. Because there's another explanation. And the other explanation is that we were sampling and measuring the age of the diversity in the parent population that had founded the domestic cats. And if we had more than a dozen, which we clearly did, then the, probably the age of, of the coalescent state of that we were measuring represented the wildcat we were talking about. Now, a little archaeology. We were looking around for some good, strong archaeology, and in, 19, in 2004, John Dennis Vigny and his colleagues at the Museum of Natural History in Paris, they published a description of a grave they had found where there was a young child buried right next to a house cat. Co-occurrence. This was on the island of Cyprus, a place that doesn't have any wildcats. This was 9,500 years ago. So what this was interpreted by him, not by me, was that, uh, well, we think cats were probably domesticating them at about that time. This is the oldest one. There's about 50 other ar archaeological reeds that are younger, and they're illustrated on this slide here. In Egypt, 3,500 years ago, America's 500 years ago, Israel 9,000 years ago, but Cyprus, this is Vigny's one, it's 9,500. So we said probably this was about the time that cats and humans got to know each other. And 
Carlos had already demonstrated the place, which was the Middle East. Also the place called the Fertile Crescent, the same place where humankind had settled down to agricultural villages for the first time. Before that, humans weren't domesticated. They were wandering around as other gatherers. They had a few dogs, but nothing else. And they were shooting things and wandering. But in 10,000 years ago, everything changed. The lever that changed civilization, which was domestication of wild species to allow agriculture and sedentary behavior of people began. And it began in the same place where these cats live today. At that time, within a hundred, few hundred years of each other, these early farmers domesticated pigs, sheep, wheat, cattle, goats, and they lived in structures. They got tired of moving around. And they produced a lot of garbage. And they produced a lot of grain that was over winter, which was infected with mice. And what we think, we weren't there then either, but what we think, if you put all this data together, is that domestication started by wildcats, which are isolated, territorial, nasty animals. Walking in here and saying, oh, that's a pretty good deal. There's a lot of food to eat here. There's a few mice. Maybe if we behave well, we'll do okay. So, some of them did two things that were good. They found the food. And they didn't eat the children. <laughs> they learned to be tame. They had probably hardwired genetics. They're not the only species that's done it. This is Musk, Musculus domesticus, also domesticated exactly the same time, exactly the same place. This is not very well adapted to its ancestry in Asia. It cannot compete. But because humankind was there, they opened up an ancestry or an, or an environment that allowed these cats to survive. So, we believe that all the evidence put together suggests, and the domestication people, we got them to sign the papers with us, they believe this is probably the right answer. That it started there, and it started by cats wandering in, and you know, of domesticated animals, cats are unusual. First of all, most domesticated animal, there's a conscious decision, let's domesticate this big thing because we can, let's domesticate dogs because they can protect us or they can help us hunt. Let's domesticate cattle because we can eat them or because they can give us fur or we can ride on them, we can make oxen out of them and they can help us, you know, uh, dig up the, plow, plow the fields. Well, cats don't really have much of a function in that way. So perhaps what happened was they just kind of wandered in and out. And the other thing about domestic, domestication is that most domesticated animals are made that way by selection, which Charles Darwin, artificial selection, which Charles Darwin described, which basically takes a particular trait you like, a big animal or a good hunter or a good sentry or something, and you select for it by organizing the breeding. You cannot organize the breeding of a house cat in a place with no windows and no doors when the queen goes into heat. I promise you. So that wasn't done. There was no organized breeding. The cats pretty much did it themselves. They had the advantage of basically not being so nasty. They perhaps were helping control the mice. And with all that, they basically finally got invited into the living rooms. It's only been 100 years since we began to breed cats in private homes in the so-called 40 or 50 breeds of cats that we recognize today. And that is because cats themselves, even through the Egyptian time, which was 6,000 years after we think it started, there was no serious attempt at breeding, only, only very recently. That's our guess right now. We could be wrong, 
But that's what's out there, and it's based upon this integration of these different fields. Now, the Feline Genome Project was meant to solve questions like, where do the cats come from? Where does domestication take place? And many other things. So, the original cat was sequenced only twofold or so, um, and we published a paper on it a few years ago. This is cinnamon. Cinnamon is an eight year old Abyssinian cat who lives in Columbia, Missouri, and she volunteered to have her genome sequenced, and there I am getting informed consent. <laughs> a few years ago, we had a light sequence of the domestic cat. We published it in genome research. It was only a 2x coverage. It wasn't on the cover of Nature because the prophets of genomics think that if you don't have a full coverage that you can't discover anything. I think they're wrong. We discovered a few things in this. We had a lot of genes and other things. But we also recognized that there was a shortage because when you only, seek, uh, when you only sequence something twofold, because of the way sequencing is done by randomly sequencing short pieces, you're likely to sequence many pieces more than once and some places not at all. So the total amount you, that you estimate that you cover with a 2x sequence might be on the order of 70 to 75 percent if you're lucky. So 25 percent of it was missing. <clears throat> this then led to a, a, an issue that I want to show you a little bit about. One of the reasons that we're interested in the domestic cat is because it's a veterinary model and a medical model for many diseases. So in order to be able to map them, we needed to have a, a, a genetic map of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. However, when we mined the SNPs, the SNPs, out of cinnamon, we came across a little problem which is that there were two kinds of segments on this chromosome and two kinds of segments on this chromosome. These are the 19 cat chromosomes. One segment is red. That means that there's a SNP about every thousand base pairs. That's the way humans are. Every thousand base pairs you have a single nucleotide polymorphism. There's 12 million genetic difference between each of you and the person sitting next to you. This particular cat had that in the red regions, but the green regions there was no variation. Why? because cinnamon had gone through three episodes of inbreeding which had homogenized her genome appreciably. One was domestication itself. The second was the creation of the Abyssinian breed. And the third is cinnamon herself had a retinal disease that actually made her blind, so she was put into a pedigree in order to mine it. And that cinnamon's, cinnamon's genotype then was homogenized on three separate occasions. That's what happened here. So in order to build an array with SNPs uh, that uh, could be used, uh, Jim Mulliken led a group that uh, I was part of that basically um, <coughs> took some money from Hills Pet Food, which is in Topeka, Kansas, and they invited six cats, walked by their headquarters to have their genome sequenced. And uh, they did it in order to discover the SNPs. And they did that, and they got another 300,000, or, or excuse me, another 2 million SNPs, which allowed us to build an array which now has 70,000 SNPs on it, which we use to build a linkage map to assemble the next generation 15-fold full coverage called the top-up of the domestic cat genome. There it is right there. That's what we're talking about. So the top up is where we are today. And the truth is, I have in my briefcase here in Dublin a draft of the paper that describes the sequencing and the assembly of this so-called top up. Where are we top up? There we are. OK. And we're going to be submitting this hopefully within the next several weeks. What do we see in that? Well, we see the same thing you see in the other things, kind of boring stuff and a few interesting stuff. But let me just sort of summarize. <clears throat> the top up was the same cat, a, a cinnamon. The assembly was generated with an assembler called Kabog. The N50, which is the point at which half the contigs are bigger and half are smaller, was 18 kilobases. And the scaffold size, because there was a large number of uh, large insert libraries was 2.4. The group in St. Petersburg has annotated a number of features which I won't bore you with, but I will mention them. They include uh, the assembly, 
the Garfield browser, which allows you to look at everything I'm going to say next, DNA variations, which are SNPs and indels, repeats, there's about 60% of the genome is repeats, and there's 25 new families of repeats that were discovered. The so-called evolutionary constrained elements, which are thought to be conserved by evolutionary convergence, there's several thousand of these. There's a families of endogenous retroviruses in the cat, including RD114 and FELV and FERV, but there's another half a dozen that came out of the latest assembly. The microRNAs were all annotated with some software that's available. In fact, there's software for finding most of this stuff. Epigenetic sites, which are sites that have post um, fertilization modifications, have been interrogated in these cats by, uh, uh, by sulfate uh, sequencing. Nuclear mitochondrial uh, uh, DNA pseudogenes are all annotated. And by the way, new mites were discovered in the cat by Joe Lopez about 10 or 20 years ago um, in our lab. Uh, copy number variation has been done by uh, Thomas uh, Marquis, and there's been an assisted assembly of Felis Silvestris, which we put down to the other SNPs, done by Carlos Driscoll, the same guy who did the domestication working in David Goldman's lab. There's been a gene expansion and contractions and outliers of selection, which is being done by uh, Bill Murphy and Wes Warren right now. What do we want all this stuff for? So we can apply it to something. Well, next week there's a meeting in Boston called the um, International Conference on Advances in Canine and Human, Canine and Feline Genomics and Inherited Diseases. Kay's going. My students are going. I can't go because I got to go back to St. Petersburg and write a grant. But nonetheless, at this meeting, it's a group of a few hundred people who are so excited about the genomic empowerment of the domestic dog and the domestic cat. And they basically present their data about gene association and gen genetic studies. And just to give you a flavor of it, this is a list of 250 human genetic diseases with cat models that have been described by talented veterinary clinicians over the last 20 years. There's a spinal muscular atrophy. There's a diabetes, there's a hemophilia, there's a glaucoma, there's a, a deafness, there's a, and, and the deafness uh, actually was just worked out by Marilyn Raymond and, and uh, Victor David, we're about to submit that paper too, white deafness, it's a, it's a uh, retroviral insertion in the kit oncogene, believe it or not. Okay, so that's kind of cool. In addition to the hereditary diseases, the cats have a model that the dogs don't have, which is a plethora of nasty, viruses, which are models for human diseases that we can't cure. There's, of course, the leukemia and sarcoma viruses, which are retroviruses from whence many of the human oncogenes, which are used for diagnostic in human uh, cancers, were developed. There's a feline immunodeficiency virus, which is a first cousin of HIV AIDS, and it forms the only natural model of immunodeficiency caused by this lentivirus in nature. There's a coronavirus related to the SARS coronavirus, there's a herpes virus, there's papillomaviruses, there's several flavors. These, of course, are associated with human <coughs> uterine and cervical cancers, for which this, the only effective cancer vaccine has been developed. If your children haven't gotten that, they should. Avian flu that has panleukokinia and feline fomiviruses. These are all circulating in the cats, and cats don't have medical, medical practitioners or HMOs or drugstores. They have natural selection and genetic resistance on occasion to some of these disease. Let's, one of the points of making this genome is to try to discover those things. Ah, another thing that we're trying to do, of course, is to understand in some way how genome organization changes. And one of the ways it changes is that the genes that are in stretches and across the genome flip around once in a while. And this is a, a table we published a few years ago to illustrate that we can use the phylogenetic trees which relate different species. And then we can count up the number of inversions and translocations and identify the breakpoints much the same way we can identify breakpoints and chromosome breaks in human cancers in order to understand what were the big architectural rearrangements that took place in the genomes since we descended from that small insectivore running underneath at the feet of the dinosaurs 100 million years ago. Now, 
I'm going to talk you beyond cats now for the next few minutes by asking you to imagine what it would be like if you didn't have just Steve here, but you had all these other guys here that were working on all these other mammal and vertebrate genomes. Suppose we actually could sequence and study these, and you know this is all happening right now, but about three or four years ago, I was talking with a couple of my friends, Dave Hausler and Oliver Ryder, and we were saying, you know, the price of sequencing is really dropping quickly. It's gone from $2 billion for the human genome to 2 or $3 million for the 24 genomes I showed you, which were done in 2006 or 2007. And today, with the right kind of sweet talk, you can get a genome the size of the human, which is most of these vertebrates, sequenced for in the neighborhood of $1,000, sometimes less, for the reagents. Now, that doesn't count all the informatics, but it does count the reagents of getting the sequence data. So we thought that the hard part, that it really was now a possibility not just to sequence a handful of domestic species, maybe the elephant and, and uh, the couple, couple of interesting primates, but actually the price dropped so low we could do them all. We could do everything we could catch. But we figured that the difficult part would not be the technology for generating the sequence, but it would be getting the right specimens done, high quality DNA, getting communities around these things, and doing bioinformatics that was robust and to a high standard. So it was actually useful to the communities that were using it. Because a sequence dump of 100 million 100 MERS or 50 MERS sitting in a, in a database doesn't get a lot of hits. What gets a lot of hits are the browsers that have the genes and SNPs and the microRNAs and the repeats and the expanded genomes. So for want of a better idea, we said let's talk or think or plan to organize communities into a loosely based consortium with one goal, which is to sequence or facilitate the whole genome sequence and analysis and display and release of lots of species. And for want of a round number, we picked 10,000 because we knew that there's 60,000 vertebrate species named and 10,000 is a good start. So, we got a little seed money from the American Genetics Association, and I brought together a series of researchers. Now, if you look at these guys, you'll realize that they're all real smart guys, but they're not the smartest geneticists and the bioinformatics guys I knew. These are the guys that have spent their life collecting specimens. They've traveled around the world, and they have freezers full of things. And so we brought them to Santa Cruz in 2009 and we said, you're going to be the seed of the Genome 10K project. And the Genome 10K project has as its goal to facilitate the sequencing of 10,000 species of vertebrates within the next decade. So there was a lot of discussion about it. In fact, the first night we met in a saloon. You call them a pub, but this is where we were. And everybody argued about what uh, overly ambitious, audacious, bodacious, and silly project goes, where are you going to get the money? I says, don't worry about that. I'll worry about getting the money. What I want you guys to do is to tell us how you would do it if you had the money. And they began to think about it in the bar. And the next morning, we broke up into groups. Mammals, fish, amphibians, birds, reptiles, five groups, and I said, you sit down at your computers and you see how many samples you have <clears throat> that represent a different species in that group. And that'll be the beginning of our database. And then we're going to write a report and we're going to publish it. So they did that, and in three days, they came up with a list of G10K species for birds, reptiles, mammals, amphibian, and fish. I, I told you there were 60,000. 
They came up with a list of 16,203. David Hausler put this into a database at the Santa Cruz browser. The Santa Cruz browser is the place where people deposit their whole genome sequences for comparative genomics. He's the head director of it. And this was the beginning of Genome 10K. We published a white paper in Journal of Heredity, which is published by the American Genetic Association. We picked that journal because they had funded this workshop. And we felt that they deserved to basically share in the credit. Then we decided to go ahead and pick species. So we said if we're going to pick the first 100 species or 200 species, how will we do it? And the committees, this, they did this at the first meeting, based upon phylogenetic breadth to capture diversity across the major groups. Scientific communities, there's somebody there who cares about the species who can work on it. Is there a context, is there a question or a biological adaptation which is just so interesting like echolocation or like deep sea diving or like just big elephants? that cares about it? Is there a popular species? Is the giant panda has got to be sequenced by somebody? Uh, interesting biological questions that have to do with things we don't know about. And can we ever get a specimen from this thing? Which is another issue. That was the beginning of focusing in. <clears throat> there were several media publications about this after the white paper came out. And, uh, you know, they say, well, biology is going to do the 10,000. Where are you going to get the money? I would say, well, you know, it's going to be a mixture of things. Sure, we're going to look for a deep-pocketed donor that's going to fund it. And sure, we're going to see if we get the government to do it. But actually, the government was sort of moving away from this now because this was exactly the same time that the next-gen sequencing was blowing up. It was becoming very fashionable. Short read sequences by Illumina, even 454. Very cheap, very short, impossible to assemble. So if you can't assemble them, de novo, NIH said, we're not going to do any more of these animals. We got 30 of them. NSF said the same thing. And we're sitting there going, well, Genome 10K is talking about, you know, 10,000 species. So uh, I'm not sure I like this. I don't think it's that well thought out either. Then I got a call from lots of people who would say, well, you know, wait a minute now. I want to do the uh, snow leopard, and I don't want you guys doing it. I said, oh, okay, do you have the money? And they said, yeah. And I said, okay, we'll not do the snow leopard. We'll put your name on the snow leopard, okay? And I got a lot of those calls. And then I got a call from Wang Jun. Wang Jun and Henry Yang and Wang Jian direct Beijing Genomics Institute, or BGI. This is a modest little center in China that started out by sequencing the first 1% of the human genome. They did a pretty good job. And then the Chinese government were very proud of them. So the Shenzhen government, which is a province next to Hong Kong, they brought these three guys down to Shenzhen. And they looked over the harbor. They brought them up on the hill. And they said, you know, we want to build a huge harbor and technology center here, and we want you guys to come, and we'll pay for it. How much are you going to pay? How much do you need? They gave them a line of credit to build the center for 1.5 billion U.S. dollars. They said, we think we can work with that. <laughs> they built it up. They bought. 125 Illumina High Seek 2000 machines, and they hired 3,000 people. And they began to sequencing things. And Wang Jun says to me, I want to be part of Genome 10K. And the reason that I want to be part is that we're bioinformaticians and we're genetic, we're, we're, in, we're engineers and we're, we're computer scientists and we want the biological community. And you guys are building the biological community. I said, that's great. I'm coming over there. So I came over there, and I visited with them, and we signed a memorandum of understanding. And they agreed to basically join us formally, officially. We also signed memorandum with other sequencing centers. And they also said, I talked them into this. I said, you know, 
you did the first 1% of the human genome, why don't you do the first 1% of G10K for nothing? And then you'll be respectable because we'll have all this community working with you. And, you know, we'll just release it and everybody will enjoy this. And they said, that's a deal. So that was in the memorandum. Then we went to Cold Spring Harbor to the Biology of Genomes meeting that year. This was in 2010. Henry Yang was there. I wrote a little announcement to him to make after the coffee break on the third day. And he said what I just said. We've joined with G10K. We're going to sequence the first 1% of the human genomes. And we think that sequencing nature's wonders is a great idea. The media were interested in that. They began to publish articles about Chinese are in, they're doing it, and maybe the Chinese are going to do it all and we're not going to do anything in the States. It had the effect that the phone didn't stop ringing then. People would call and say, wait a minute, I want to do the manatee, and I want to do the parrot, and I want to do this fish, and I want to do the seal can. Like, well, do you have the money? Yeah. You want me to get the Chinese not to do it? Yeah, we don't want the Chinese to do it. I said, you want to do the American Eagle? I said, well, the Chinese are willing to do the American Eagle. <laughs> so they said, no, 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 we want to do it. I said, okay, let me cross it out. <laughs> and basically the number went up. Then Broad Institute got involved. They wanted to do 50 new mammals. I said, you got the money? Oh, we'll get it from NIH. I said, NIH told me they weren't going to fund it anymore. Well, that changed. Okay, now NIH is funding it a little more and they're paying for it. G10K had the same influence that Sputnik had in the United States on the funding for this stuff. It basically started to happen. We had our third meeting in Fort Lauderdale a couple of months ago. At that time, there were about 110 species genomes that were paid for and announced that were going to be sequenced or were sequenced. BGI had picked their 100. The Broad had another 100 of mammals they were going to do. Baylor had seven primates. Altogether, there were 340 species. That was up from 24 mammals that were sponsored four years earlier with an announcement that we're going to stop. So I think that we've gone up almost tenfold, a thousand percent, and we haven't raised a lot of money yet. But we're continuing to put in for large grants. There's a large grant going on right now in Guangdong for several millions of dollars to help continue this. A few other things. The first BGI species were fishes, amphibians, non-avian reptiles, birds, mammals. Now, if you look at the so-called tree of life and you look for people, they're nested in primates or apes, which is nested in primates, which is nested in mammals, which is nested in fish because all things came from the sea. So half of the vertebrate species described today are fish. There's a lot of them. Now, I didn't want G10K to become a fish project, but I was happy to get the fish community excited about it, and I got more excited about it as I learned more about these fish. So there were 29 species that were picked, 10 have been done, 14 are in projects, and there's four or five that we still haven't got the specimens. But if you look at the, at the tree, as when we had the first meeting in 2009, it looked like this. These are the ones that were sequenced, but pretty soon, the tree was filled in with species with whole genome sequences. So we're actually having enough sequences to start serious comparative genomics with in fish. In the non-avian reptiles, the same thing is happening. Not quite as much. Why? Well, reptiles have really big genomes. Some of them are 10, 20 gigabits, spaces long. And the truth is, I feel bad about the assemblers when they tell us, don't give me a fish or a, a reptile because it's too big. A salamander is a nightmare. And what they said at the last genome meeting at the assemblathon session was, there's some species that would probably benefit from probably not being done today, but waiting until we get a little bit better. And one of that groups is the fish. <laughs>
or the non-avian reptiles, excuse me. So here's some of them. There are a few that are going on to get transcriptomes, to get some of the genes identified, but they're not going to be proper uh, gold standard assemblies. Same thing with amphibians. There's not too many of them, but we're getting them going. But with, with um, here's an amphibian tree. These are, the, these are the ones that are all picked. Now birds are another story. There's 10,000 species of birds, and there's a consortium called the Avian uh, Genome Consortium that is putting together the whole genome sequence analysis of 50 different bird species. They are basically planning to publish a whole issue of science on this, and it's supposed to be submitted any day now, although I've been saying that for a few months. We're keeping our fingers crossed, but we're very proud of the international cooperation that's gone on in this consortium because they really do have a chance to have a really nice, robust data set with very high standards. And it's being led by Goji Zhang from BGI, Tom Gilbert from uh, Copenhagen, and Eric Jarvis from Duke. Mammals are even doing better. There's, uh, in BGI, we've got 35 species nominated, and most of them are done. And if you look at the tree of mammals that we published nine years ago, there are something like 195 mammals that are scheduled to be sequenced in the next year or so, and annotated like I've talked about in the cat. All right, so what are the things that we brag about when we talk about G10K now? I'll just mention a few because I want you to understand that, first of all, this is not a government project where we're paying for everything and we're controlling it. It's rather a voluntary consortium of scientists who have gotten together to lobby as a group for advancing genome scientists and giving to the next generation, to the students in this room, a gift, which is the genome sequence of every species that you can catch. Okay, the original paper was the white paper, which came out in Journal Heredity in 2009. There was also a tissue sampling for the different kinds of methods and standards that are being recommended. There was a fish genome 10K paper that came out a few years ago. The first next-gen sequencing paper was the panda, came out of BGI. There was a sequencing paper on the naked mole rat, which came out in Nature. The yak at the high altitude led us to understand not only the yak, but human adaptation to high altitude in that place. So with BGI and, 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 and uh, Neil's, uh, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, I'll think of his name in a second. Um, any, uh, there was uh, the macaque, and yesterday the Amer tiger genome sequence was released. Uh, and published in Nature uh, uh, Communications, I think, yes. In addition, the challenges of the assembly has been handled by the Assemblathon, which is a competition of 30 or 40 workers who took, first of all, a synthetic genome and attempted to optimize their methods for assembly, and then they got frustrated. Uh, they basically uh, decided that the first analysis, that the SOAP de Novo all pass LG and string graph was the best one, However, uh, they didn't do a real genome, so this year they um, sequenced three, they assembled three real genomes, a parrot, a cichlid, and a snake, and that was presented at uh, Genome 10K meeting, the Assemblaton 2, and their conclusions were kind of interesting, which is that every species is different. And some assemblers work with this species, and some assemblers work best with the other species, because we, the leaders, or the three amigos at Genome 10K, kept saying, tell us what to teach. Which are the best methods? How do we set up a program for teaching assembly? The people throughout the world want to drive these assemblers themselves. They don't want to send them to Broad. They don't want to send them to BGI. They want to get the sequence, and they want to drive the assemblers. Tell us what the best ones to do are. They listened to us, and they said, well, we're not really sure, but all of them are pretty good and some new ones that are being developed. Collecting specimens is a, is a resolve that Genome 10K endorses terrifically. I have a big collection at NCI, which has now been transferred to the Smithsonian. It's available on open access for anybody from all these species. Ollie Ryder has a similar collection at the San Diego Zoo. Des and I were talking about aligning yesterday. There's an Alinathon competition which has as its parent umbrella Genome 10K, which is essentially an attempt to try to come up with a better way to align whole genome sequences so that when we do comparative genomics for exchanges, for gene expansions, for 
things that have happened, for dynamic things based upon today's sequence in this individual, we'll get it right and we'll avoid the artifacts of assembly and those kinds of things. So our role has grown from gathering voucher specimens and identifying species communities. We've also got committees that are setting standards for genome assembly and sequencing and annotation and releases to monitor the progress, to encourage and demand rapid data release if it gets our seal of approval, to raise funds and to spawn offspring. What do we mean by that? Well, after Genome 10K came along, a few other communities said, what about us? Why don't you include us? I said, start your own, buddy. So the insect people started Insect 5K. They got funding from the AGA, the American Genome Genetic Association. They had a workshop. They published a white paper. There is a global invertebrate genomics alliance, which is, is, is determined to sequence 10,000 species of marine invertebrates. They had a meeting at NOVA. Uh, University in Fort Lauderdale, where I'm lucky enough to have a, a, an appointment uh, last uh, March. There's a Thousand Plants Genome Project, which is being coordinated by several people, including BGI. There's even a repertoire Gen 10K, which is an attempt to sequence a thousand people, just their T cell receptors and MHC genes being led by Zhang Han at the uh, Hudson Alpha Institute in Huntsville, Alabama. Of course, all of these stand on the shoulders of the International Barcode of Life Project, which is a project uh, uh, Paul Hebert began about eight years ago, which I'm sitting on one of their boards. And that project is meant to take a small sequence of the CO2 mitochondrial gene and sequence every species on Earth so that they'll have a name, address, and serial number to recognize them by. Not because it's an exercise in genetics, but because it's an exercise which will speed up the monitoring and the cataloging of the world's diverse species. Shaking insects out of an Amazon tree, sampling the nematodes in a coral reef, and those sorts of things are done by batch sequencing and identifying the sequences. It's not a taxonomic exercise. It's an exercise to pretty much count species with a rough idea of replication. It's not perfect, but it does connect genetics directly to diversity and natural history. That's the reason I like it. And also, it's simple to understand. You don't have to be you know, a nuclear physicist or a rocket scientist to understand Genome 10K. There's thousands of people involved in it. They're having a big meeting in Kunming in, in uh, uh, next month, and they're hoping to get millions of species in the next few years. In addition to that, BGI and Lori Goodman, the founding editor of Nature Genetics and Genome Research, started up a journal called GigaScience. It's basically a journal that publishes short articles describing the kind of work I've been talking about, about genome sequencing, genome association, but it contains a large cloud-based database that allows the, the, the data, the the, the raw data and even the interpreted derivative data to be deposited for people to see in open access. I think this is a wave of the future. I think we're going to see it. The first, <coughs> the first cottage industry uh, genome sequence, the parrot, was published in, in, in Giga Science by uh, Tarasso Lexic and his colleagues, who was one of Emma's lab mates at NCI. I'm running out of time, she says, so I will say we are committed to open data release at Genome 10K. Uh, this is illustrated by Darwin's Finch, the, the, the sequence of which was released openly last year before publication. These are some of the cats that we're working on right now that we're excited about, and I'd really like now to say thanks to the people who did this. Warren Johnson's responsible for the Fila Day Tree, Marilyn Raymond for a lot of the genetics of diseases, Carlos for domestication, Joan Pontius and the team at NCI who did the assembly, the group and the fish group and, uh, of G10K, the uh, BGI team that has basically been such big, big promoters, Henry Yang, Wang Jun, Wang Jian, the G10K community of scientists. Here are pictures of the three amigos of Genome 10K, younger and better looking than any of us ever were any, again. And finally, I'd like to thank my team at the Dubjansky Center for Genome Bioinformatics in St. Petersburg for their support and for help being me move this vision into uh, reality. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.